<laughs> anyway, uh, welcome uh, for everybody. Thank you for being here. If you're physically in here in the room with us, we know many of you are joining us online uh, here in Jacksonville and elsewhere. And thank you for joining us as well. And uh, some people are going to be watching this at a later time. So thank you for tuning in also. Um, you guys know we're in the middle. If you've been here the last few weeks, we're in the middle of this series uh, called Better. And uh, we're talking about how Jesus is better than anything else you can pursue, prioritize, or build your life around. And so we're going to stick with that theme today. And I just wanted to do a little bit of work to catch you up if you weren't here the last several weeks, just so you're kind of on the same page with the rest of us. But for the first several weeks of this series, we just camped out reading the first three verses of the book of Hebrews. And that's all about how Jesus is transcendent. It talks about him in terms of the son of the father, that is God. And he is the exact representation of the father's being. He's the heir of all things. He's the one through whom the universe was made. Uh, we talked about just all these things that make Jesus, Jesus, that make him transcendent and up here. And then a couple weeks ago, we talked about how in Hebrews 2, uh, it talks about how Jesus was actually even though he's up here, he was made low for a time. He became flesh and blood, a person just like you and me. And uh, he also then in his earthly life experienced what you could call the most tragic fall in a sense from hero status to rejected and scorned by his peers and the authority. And not just in spite of that, but actually because of that, he achieved these great victories of being crowned with glory and honor of being made holy and sanctified and perfect and conquering the one who holds the power of death. And then we talked about how because he was made flesh and blood, he was made with us, that as he accomplished those great victories, those great achievements, they actually spilled out to us so that the way God sees it is this, if we are arm in arm with our big brother Jesus, you, me, anybody who is a Christian, who is a follower of Jesus, that is, is arm in arm with Jesus and all those victories and achievements spill over to us as well. So that's where we've been the last few weeks. And we're actually gonna pick up right about where we left off in Hebrews chapter three. And if you want to turn there in the Bible, uh, whether you brought one or if you wanna use the one in front of you, it's page 847 if you're using the brown Bible in the pew in front of you. Or if you prefer, you can actually just read along with as I have the scriptures here on the screen as well. Quick question before we move on. You guys ever heard of Bear Grylls? So Bear Grylls, he's a, an adventurer. He was in the British Secret Services. He's a pretty wild guy and he's a survivalist in a sense. So he goes on these adventures and um, he can kind of like survive any, any uh, challenge to the life of a man in wilderness, desert, whatever. And so he actually got a show and he takes celebrities with him and uh, they go on these adventures, like he's brought Zac Efron with him, Channing Tatum, uh, Vanessa Hudgens. He brought Shaq one, with him one time, uh, Marshawn Lynch. So he just takes celebrities and then they go on these wild adventures and it's his job to keep them safe and alive through, through the adventure. So we're gonna talk about that a little later, but what do Bear Grylls and Jesus have in common? All right, that's a little brain teaser. You can just tuck it away, like be working on it in the background of your mind while we talk. But um, he's a crazy guy. You know, he's the kind of guy like, he'll like, okay, I'm going to get a little graphic. So cover the ears if you have little ones around. But he'll like kill an animal and, and eat, eat its, you know, heart or something like that. Or uh, I think one time he, uh, he had to cool down. So he, he made a rag wet and then he put it on his head to, to cool him down. Except he didn't have any water available. He, he only had bodily fluids available to make the rag wet. Like that's the kind of guy that he is. I'm, I'm trying to use euphemism here to, to protect you from the most squeamish elements, but he's a, he's a pretty intense dude. In fact, he brought Deion Sanders on his show because Deion Sanders, his kids convinced him to go on the show with Bear Grylls because he said, they said, they told Deion like, dad, you're getting soft. You got to do something about this. So he got Deion Sanders on the show, but the whole Deion Sanders show was kind of like Deion Sanders is afraid of snakes. It's not a good thing if you go on wilderness uh, adventures. And so Bear Grylls actually killed a snake in front of him, but then he made, made him eat it, you know. As a, so he, he's, he, he's an interesting guy anyway. But if you were going on an adventure, you, you might want Bear Grylls with you. So what does that have to do with anything? We'll get there eventually. But we're going to read Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6 uh, to start here. And I'll read it. You can read along with me in your Bible or on here on the screen. 
Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who was appointed him, who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house. And we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. So I don't know if you caught it there, but here the writer of Hebrews continues with this theme of better, and he sets up a compare and contrast with Moses. So let me just show you what I'm talking about. There's a quote here from the Old Testament that says, Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house. And then it says a little bit later, but Christ is faithful as the son over God's house. And so he's making the point that Jesus was even greater than Moses. And so for most of you sitting here growing up in America in the 21st century, if, if, you, if that was your background, that might not be a shocking statement, but to the original listeners, this would carry a fair bit of weight because Moses was in many ways like a founding father of their, their nation, their culture. And so he might be like to us, a George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. kind of rolled up into one. Like he was a towering figure in history. And so what I want to do next is I actually just want to kind of paint the picture of remind you of who Moses was and what role he played, because that's going to be important for everything else we're going to read and we're going to talk about. And so some of this may be familiar, but it'll help to kind of like have preloaded all this stuff about Moses and who he was and the role that he played in Israel's history uh, to help you. So are you okay with me on that? We're going to take a little bit of a tangent and a detour here, but it'll be, it'll be really helpful for the rest of what we're going to discuss today. So Moses came on the scene in the pages of the Bible during a very interesting time in Israel's history. They were in captivity in Egypt. They were in slavery and oppression. They, they, had, they were in a tough situation. But God called Moses supernaturally and very clearly, and he said, I have a special role for you, Moses. I actually want to use you to deliver the people out of Egypt. All this sounding familiar so far, probably to most of you. And uh, Moses was actually reluctant at first. He didn't want to do it. He said, well, what about my brother Aaron? I think he would be the better candidate. And God says, no, 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 Moses. I want you to do it. And the fact that the Israelites were in captivity was not something that passed unnoticed by God. In fact, he, he predicts this way in advance. If you go all the way back to Genesis 15, where God's speaking with Abraham, he says he describes what's going to happen in the timeline. And then he even describes the events around Moses and helping the Israelites be delivered from their bondage, slavery, and oppression in Egypt. Well, anyway, Moses finally gets on board with God's plan and... Uh, God starts working behind the scenes and he's doing many things and he's working through the ruler of Egypt who is Pharaoh, who's kind of keeping the Israelites under, under his thumb. And he, he starts bringing about these plagues, right? That's supposed to motivate Pharaoh and help him, help him see that God is in charge, in fact, and that if he wants uh, anything good to come of his country, he better let the Israelites go. But Pharaoh is hard-hearted, doesn't want to let him go, and so he's kind of fighting it. And God just keeps turning up the tension, and he's using Moses as his mouthpiece to, to make this deliverance. And he even tells, God tells the people, listen, I want you to do this meal called the Passover meal. And when you eat it, I want you to eat it like with your sandals on, ready to go, like cell phone in hand, keys in hand, because I'm going to take you out of this country. And your job, your job is to be ready to go when the moment strikes. And so the, the tension keeps ratcheting up. And eventually the very last night, they have the plague of the firstborn. And uh, you can read about it on your own time, but it's still the last straw. And Pharaoh finally agrees and says, okay, good, take your people and get out of here because we don't want any more of this. So the people leave and uh, they flee. And then as they flee, Pharaoh changes his mind and pursues them up into the Red Sea. So think about this, hundreds of thousands of people together traveling through the wilderness, getting trapped in a sense with the Red Sea on one side and the Egyptians chasing them, ready to destroy them on the other side. And probably some fear there, right? Here's how the people respond. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? 
What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So that was their response. Fear, right? And Moses says, guys, guys, no, hang on. God's doing something here and he's going to see you through this, but you got to trust him and you got to be patient. And you guys know what happens next because it's kind of world famous in that God, again, gives them a miraculous deliverance from their situation and helps them, ushers them through the Red Sea. But their adventure doesn't end there because they have to continue wandering in the wilderness. And the next place they stop, uh, they call it Mara because they found a place that had water, but the water was too bitter to drink. And so the people weren't happy about this either. And so they grumble once more and complain against Moses. They keep traveling, they keep traveling. And then the next place they get to, they are upset because they don't have enough food to eat. And this is what they say, or at least they don't have the food they want. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, if only. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. So not very words of encouragement, positivity, and faithfulness, would you say? And it's painful to read this because when you read it, what are you reading? You're reading the account of the most famous deliverance and rescue mission the world has ever known. And yet, ironically, at the time, the people who were on that rescue mission, who were being rescued, uh, they were not happy and they were continuously grumbling and upset. And it's, it's, it's actually kind of, it hurts to read it because there's a sharp irony and mismatch of what's happening and the people's response. And it's been said that Moses took the Israelites out of Egypt but he couldn't get Egypt out of the Israelites because they kept wanting to go back to what they knew, even though it included slavery and oppression. And it's painful to read, but the interesting thing is, this is not just a series of stories about a certain people in a certain time, because throughout the Bible, these events are referenced back repeatedly in the context of, listen, you know these stories, right? You remember what happened here? You got to learn the lesson because this isn't just about these people this time. This is just about people and you want to learn the lesson. And I don't know if you can see a little bit of that in yourself. I mean, you know, one thing I was thinking about reflecting on this this week is um, I love movies. I know some of you guys love movies, but think about the movies that you tend to watch. Don't they usually involve some level of challenge or adventure or, or something that the, the characters have to overcome that's, that's intimidating. And so, so like Harry Potter, right? Any Harry Potter fans out there? Yeah, or Star Wars, Star Wars. Uh, what else? Lord of the Rings, any Lord of the Rings nerds in here? Cool, cool, I'm with you. What about Rocky? Anybody like the Rocky series? I say you should just keep going, man. Just keep making those things. But would you watch a Rocky where he thinks about fighting somebody and then just like decides, nah, I'm not going to do it this time. Like you wouldn't even watch that movie because there's no challenge. There's no risk. There's no adventure. And so you're drawn to these movies because you know that that's part of life. You know that risk and challenge and adventure is it's part and parcel of life. And it actually inspires you and draws you. That's when it comes to movies. But then when it comes to my actual daily life, you know, if something so much as my coffee maker doesn't work in the morning. I mean, that can just tank me right there, you know? I'm so frustrated. Or your iPhone doesn't type the letter I. Theoretically speaking, you know? Or it's one of the seven days of the year in Jacksonville when you have to go out and scrape the ice off of your car. Why do I have to do this? This is why I moved to Florida so I wouldn't have to do this. So maybe you can relate on some small level. But you know, the story doesn't end there. I, I want to paint the picture for you. This is not to depress you, but just to give you a sense of a pattern because it's not just one thing, it was a pattern. But the people were thirsty for water there. This is one of their next campsites. And they grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us out of Egypt? Are you noticing a pattern here? 
Why did you bring us out of Egypt? To make us and our children and livestock die of thirst. Bit of accusation in the tone, right? You appeal to the kids and the cows and you're here to kill us. And, and actually they named this place Masa and Meribah, which in the Hebrew means quarreling and testing because the people, though they may not have realized it, were quarreling, and, quarreling with and testing God. Their accusations were pointed towards people, but God saw it slightly differently. Fast forward several months, my clicker's working again, that's great. The people were in a new campground. The problem now is they want meat, enough with the manna. It was great for a while. We want meat. But here's where they ended up. Imagine this in our annual church camping campground event. Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance to their tents. Why, Moses? Can you imagine the chorus of whole families wailing? We're not talking about a couple people here. This is like hundreds of thousands of people wailing at the entrance to their tents. You, you get a sense why Moses over and over in the scriptures is like, God, how long do you want me to be with these people? And what do you want me to do with them? I mean, Moses at certain times says like, God, please just kill me. And maybe you can understand why. You know, in the next chapter, Moses' brother and sister, Miriam and Aaron, uh, they get this attitude and they're like, oh yeah, Moses. Is, is God only speak through Moses? Is Moses the only one that God can speak through? Um, well, God didn't like that. So you can read about what happened next, but God took that one personally as well. And then the next couple chapters, uh, the Israelites finally get to the promised land. This is what God was, ushered them out of Egypt to get to. They were getting to this great land that was perfectly made for them. It was better than their hopes and dreams. And they were right on the verge and they send out a scout team. The scout team uh, goes, scouts the land, comes back and delivers a very negative, pessimistic uh, report, except for a couple exceptions who are like, guys, no, this is, why we were, this is why we were ushered out so we could take this land. But the other people are like, no, we shouldn't do it. This is not, we will be killed. And so here's actually what they said. Then the whole community broke into loud cries and the people wept that night. All the Israelites complained about Moses and Aaron and the whole community told them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt or if only we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to die by the sword? Our wives and little children will become plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's appoint a leader new leader, and go back to Egypt. So I read all those to say, this was not a one-time thing. It wasn't just a bad day. This was a pattern, a mentality. And this was actually the final straw that kind of broke the camel's back because God finally, kind of like a parent when your kids are like whining and complaining, if you're a parent, and you finally just kind of give them what they're saying, he's like, okay, you guys are saying this, that's, that's what's gonna happen now. In fact, someone is going to get the promised land. Someone is going to enter that great place, but it's not going to be you. It'll be your children. And so it's not a great ending, right? It's a, it's a, it's a lesson, if anything. But Moses' role in this is that he was to be the trusted guide, but obviously he was not trusted. Same with God himself. The way God saw it was God himself was supposed to be the trusted guide and yet was not trusted. And so over and over again, through the scriptures, these events and these stories are referenced back in the context of, guys, you gotta, you gotta learn the lesson from what came before you. This is to be applied to you so that you don't have the same outcome as what these people experience. And in fact, um, these stories are referenced throughout the Psalms, but in particular in Psalm 95. And then what we're about to read next, the next verses from Hebrews chapter three, are a quote from Psalm 95. So it's really kind of interesting and cool because you've got these events in Exodus and Numbers, then you've got the reference in Psalm 95, and then you've got the reference back to one, which is a reference back to the other. It's like the Bible is a hyperlinked document, which is really kind of amazing actually. So we're gonna read that next, verses seven through 11. So, as the Holy Spirit says, and here begins the quote from Psalm 95, Today, 
If you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And so once again, you have here, you have a reference back to Psalm, which is a reference back to these events. And the whole point is, let's learn the lesson. God had this great plan, this great destination set up. There was a place of rest, a place of abundance, a place of a good life that was planned and set forth for them. But in the meantime, before they got there, there was going to be some traveling. There was going to be some inconveniences, some discomforts, a lot of uncertainty, and even some pretty serious challenges. And on one hand, you read about it and you think, oh, you know, you wish they would be more positive and more faithful. But in another sense, I, I actually relate because I know how I am if I don't get to eat for half of a day. I know how I might be if I don't have water for a day or a shower for a few days. I mean, they didn't have any showers, right? I mean, can you imagine if we went on our annual church camping trip, but instead of a couple hundred of us, there was like a couple million of us and it wasn't for a couple days. It was like more like at least months and months. And you go to your first campground and uh, Ken and Sue Perry are leading the way and we don't have cars, so we gotta walk. And so we walk all the way to Okefenokee Swamp in Georgia and we're just ready to get there and set up our tents and we get there and guess what? There's no water. Come on, Ken and Sue, didn't you wanna plan a place that had water? You might be struggling a little bit, right? You know, and you keep going, you keep camping, you go from one campground to the next throughout the state of Georgia, you're traveling all the way north, like you're going to South Carolina or Tennessee or something. And then you get to the next place and you're just, you're done with it, right? You're done with setting up your tent and packing it up and figuring out who to camp next to. And oh yeah, Debbie Mackey borrowed your water bottle a few days ago and you, you haven't seen it since that. <laughs> just kidding, Debbie wouldn't do that. Debbie would be like giving you her water bottle actually, yeah. But you know, you ran out of s'mores a few days ago. You don't have any hot dogs left. You're down to like rice and beans and you're just not having it. And can you just imagine what that would be like? And you hear from the word on the street that the next campground isn't gonna have water either. And by word on the street, I mean those little fake streets that wind through the campground. <laughs> you might be struggling a little bit, but zooming out here and looking at what happened, God had a destination. He says it was a place of rest a place of plenty, a place of abundance, a good place that God had marked out for them and planned from ages. But the people would have to go on an adventure first. And that adventure would necessarily come with discomfort, inconvenience, uncertainty, and challenge. Because that's the nature of an adventure. We wish they had trusted their adventure guide but they didn't, but we are to learn from their lesson. And so I just have one point, one point today. And that is for you, you are on a holy adventure. So trust your holy adventure guide. You are on a holy adventure. So trust your adventure guide. Because listen, if you're not a Christian or you're seeking, you're not sure where you're at, we, we would love for you to understand what it means to follow Jesus and to make that decision. And we're, we'd be happy to help you. But for those of us here who already are Christians, when you become a Christian, I believe all those great victories and achievements that Jesus accomplished that we talked about at the beginning of the lesson, they apply to you. You get to experience the victory of the conquering of death. You get to be exalted like Jesus to rule with honor and glory. You get to be sanctified and made holy. However, it doesn't mean that you have reached your full and ultimate rest that we all look forward to. You are actually still on this holy adventure where you are experiencing discomfort and uncertainty and inconvenience and challenge. I mean, you probably experienced it on some level this morning, didn't you? 
I mean, let's be real. Let's be honest. And yet you have a trustworthy adventure guide that you can fully, fully trust. I appreciated Jeff Humphreys uh, did the message at the camping trip and it was awesome. He, he related some of his adventures on the annual church camping trip from years back where he had, a, I think, a five by five tent, but he's like six foot something. And so his feet were sticking out on one of those really cold, frigid camping trips. And, you know, it's, it's, kind, of part of the, it's kind of part of the deal with it. I know I feel prayed that, you know, thank you for our church vacation camping trip. Well, to me, it was one of those things where I had to come home and almost felt like I needed a vacation from my vacation on this last one. Because we had a great time, but we, uh, my wife and I invited our neighbor and she came along with her daughter who was two. So it was great. We had my daughter's five and then my son who's three and then a two-year-old. And you know, it was just, there was a lot more variables camping with little kids than there are just camping by yourself. And we first got there and started setting up our, our, our tents uh, for, in our camp, campsite. And uh, we had a really narrow one and we had two tents and so we were trying to figure out where to put them. And at one point we were, we were trying to like, you know, manage the children, set up two tents. But we also had, our campsite was the cut through that all the kids were using to get to the DiCarvalho party bus. And so it was this massive, massive foot traffic. And at one point I was standing there with a, a bin, like a heavy bin of stuff in my hand, trying to move it. And there was like five people to my left and five people to my right. And I couldn't even move anywhere. And I, you know, a little, a nerve just like misfired in my brain. Like, ah, what's happening right here? <laughs> and so there was moments like that. The first night I went to bed early with my kids, just trying to get them like settled down. You know, we took a trip to the bathroom uh, so hopefully they wouldn't have to go at night when it's inconvenient and you have to get up and it's cold. Well, um, that was the first of five trips to the potty that night. And I, I don't know if it was on one of them, but at some point I, I, was, I was just so done. And my daughter, you know, she put her boots on and we, we walked to go to the, the potty and her boots weren't tied. And somebody was like, oh, dad, kids' boots aren't tied. And I was just like, don't, don't respond. Nothing good is going to come out of your mouth right now. So I told, I told my wife on the way home, I, she, we were reflecting on funny things, bad things, hard things, you know, memories. And there was lots of great memories. And I was like, you know, it, it, it was great. It wasn't relaxing, but it was an adventure that we made memories on. And I, I adjusted, I had to adjust my expectations of what this is about. And that's just camping. I mean, if you, if you found it restful and relaxing, great, more power to you. You don't have to feel guilty about it. Awesome. <laughs> I'll farm my kids off to you next year. That will work. But, but I had to adjust my expectations. That's just a camping trip. But what about your life? Because it's easy to sink into this default expectation that, you know, life and people are, are here in a sense to serve you and to make your life free of discomfort and, and inconvenience and, and even serious challenge and uncertainty. And our culture, let, you got to step, step out and look at our culture. Our culture is a culture of consumerism where companies work very hard, work very hard to make things very easy and convenient to you. And it's not because they love you. It's because they want you to give them your money in response for their service or product. And that's, that's what it is. I'm not, I'm not even condemning that. I'm just saying that mistrains you potentially and misleads you to think that that is actually the nature of life. Whereas no, that is not the nature of life. The nature of life is an adventure. And think about what we're about as a church. We're about life transformation. Life transformation doesn't happen through certainty and security and all comfort and all convenience and things being handed to you on a silver platter. Life transformation comes on a holy adventure where there's risk involved, there's challenge involved, there's uncertainty involved, there's inconvenience, and there's discomfort. And it's not that we have to love those things, but we may have to adjust our expectations because we're on a holy adventure and to trust our adventure guide because he's a good, worthy adventure guide.
So you think about how, how does this apply to you? Well, a couple things I can think of. One, how are you with handling uncertainty and inconvenience and discomfort? Do you regard it inherently as a problem or as the people around you failing you, whether it's work or school or church life or your spouse or your kids? I mean, I can, I can do that. I can look at discomfort as it must be someone's fault. Well, I mean, sometimes it is, right? But there's also just a certain amount of that that just comes with the territory of life. And do you, do you gravitate towards, is your pattern of behavior and, and mentality one of complaining, accusing, finding fault? Or is it, no, I'm on a holy adventure. And this comes with the territory. And I want to read the very next verses in Hebrews. I don't have this in my notes or on the screen, but I want to uh, maybe think about a scripture that you've, you may have heard many times and in this context, because I think it's worth doing. Verse 12. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. And you heard um, Heather and Poi and Orlando up here talking about encouraging one another regularly, consistently. And this is a great scripture that talks about that. And, you know, sometimes I, I, I hear the scripture, I hear it referred to, and in my mind, I think, okay, well, what does it mean to encourage somebody? And one easy thing I, I come up with sometimes is, oh, well, just say something nice to them, you know, say something complimentary to them. And then that can be a form of encouragement. But what about in terms of encouraging one another, helping each other to see how we're on a holy adventure? Because maybe you can see it for somebody else, but they're having trouble seeing it for themselves. And you can help them guide them sort of, hey, listen, you know, this problem that you're seeing, this struggle that you're going through, is it part of your holy adventure? If so, what does it mean for you to trust your holy adventure guide in this setting? And through doing that, you can potentially reframe something that could just be a struggle, negative, drag you down, make you want to have a complaining spirit into something that can actually help you grow through your holy adventure to experience life transformation because hopefully that's why you're here. You want to be transformed by God and into Jesus' likeness in increasing fashion. So Bear Grylls, um, what does Bear Grylls have in common with Jesus? Well, I had this whitewater uh, rafting guide one time. Uh, it was in West Virginia. His name was Eric, and I don't even know why I remember his name because I only knew him for like three hours. But, you know, he, he, was a, he was a reasonably good whitewater rafting guide uh, in West Virginia. We weren't on like class five rapids. It was like class three, so it was, it was mid-grade. And uh, he was just kind of like this go with the flow, you know, real a hearty laughing kind of guy. I, I got the feeling like he, was, he, was, he liked to party maybe, you know, that was just my, my hunch. And uh, my family didn't party with him. We were just whitewater rafting. But anyway, there was a whole flotilla of, of people doing this whitewater rafting. And at some point we, we had a pause in between, maybe to eat or something in between rapids. And we got separated by quite a bit of distance. And um, the, one of the other guides who was like the main guide, I think, started shouting something like directions, I assume, or instructions to Eric, who was in the same raft as me. And I was listening. I was like, can Eric hear this guy? Because I can't actually hear what he's saying. And the guy just went on and on and on and on. And I was like, I hope, I hope he's getting this. And he let him go and go and go. And then after like two minutes, which, you know, feels like a long time, uh, he paused there was so that no one was talking. And then Eric the, in the back of the raft just goes, uh, what? I was like... <laughs> If you can't hear somebody, you got to interrupt them in the middle of their flow. Like, don't let them say the, all of their saying and then just say, what? So Eric was probably a sufficient guide for class three whitewater rapids in West Virginia. But I'm not sure I would entrust him on an adventure where there was like truly life-threatening elements. But Bear Grylls is the real deal. I mean, I told you some of the names he's brought with him. And obviously these people who are famous, uh, well-to-do people, entrusted Bear Grylls enough to actually put their life in his hands and let 
and to, for, for him to help them see them through these life-threatening circumstances on their adventure that they signed up for voluntarily. And so I say that to say that Jesus is a worthy, trustworthy adventure guide. And I want to close with two passages that just talk about this. And the first one is in Hebrews 4. It's the very next chapter. And the, the context is the word of God. But I think we can actually apply what we learn here to Jesus as a guide because the word of God is, of course, associated with Jesus quite strongly. It says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. I love this passage because it's saying, like, he already knows. He sees it all. There is nothing that escapes God's notice. There's nothing that escapes your adventure guide's notice. And the tone and, the, and the, the image that I get when I read this is almost like a surgeon, you know, whereas we are on the operating table and he's the surgeon and he sees everything. He sees the good and the bad. He knows what to leave and what to take out. He's fully capable. He's fully competent. This is the kind of trusted adventure guide who is available to you. And the question is, do you trust him? I want to read one more passage, and, and after we read this, we're going to take communion together. So I'll ask the, the ushers to prepare that. And uh, communion is a very special time for us where we want to reflect on Jesus. We remember him together. We take bread and juice that uh, represent his body and blood. And so this is Jesus who we're talking about in this passage. And he, again, is that adventure guide that we're asked to trust. The next verse is in Hebrews 4. It says, Therefore... Since we have such a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And this passage says that Jesus is the real deal, as a trustworthy adventure guide. He's been through all the same kind of things that you have been through and are going through. He's seen the same kind of challenges, temptations, pains, and griefs, the same kind of inconveniences and discomforts and uncertainties. And so he understands as a guide to you. He understands. And yet at the same time, he's ascended. And he is there to advocate for you, to guide you, to represent you before the Father. And you can be fully assured that you are in trustworthy hands of an adventure guide. As we think about this, I encourage you, trust your adventure guide. Help the people around you as well to see how they are on a holy adventure and they as well can put their lives in their hands in Jesus' hands. Let's go ahead and pray as we take communion. God, we acknowledge you this morning. We acknowledge your son and uh, we know, God, that uh, we can easily be like the Israelites who fault find, continuously complain, uh, and just, and just really fail to see the, the nature of life that we are on a, a holy adventure, but that you, are, you have promised us a safe destination if we trust you fully, um, though the way may be hard and difficult and, and full of inconvenience and or even extreme challenges. I pray that individually and together as a family, God, we can increasingly put our trust in you, put our trust in your son, to guide us and see us through, that we don't fight. We, we go along with you as a guide who can, who can safely navigate us to a great rest and a great destination. Pray as we take the, the bread and the juice that we remember Jesus, lighten in him and trust him. Pray in Jesus' name.